Hello everyone, my name is Jesse and this is the fifth episode of VGM Vibes. This is going to be the theme of Fire, a sub-series from my regular channel where instead of reacting to music, I am talking about some songs in depth relating to their theming, their biomes, etc. And of course, this is the theme of Fire. We've done, oh gosh, let's see, forest themes, we've done castle themes, battle themes, aquatic themes, so I think Fire was... Uh, eventually just going to come, but these this is going to be a the most community entries I've had on the channel. This was kind of, a, the series kind of started as just a way for me to get to, to talk about my favorite songs in those themes, but I've opened up the doors and let a lot of uh, community feedback in there. So this has about half community entries and then half of mine. So while normally I'd be able to talk about in depth what's happening uh, some of these, I, I don't know what's going on. I try my best to read and look at the context of the footage or read the comments and just kind of piece it together. So, but yeah, this is going to be, this is going to be a fun one. Fire has many, many ways it can go. Fire characters, fire levels, magma, lava, volcanoes, heat, all that stuff. I, I let that all happen. So I'm glad you guys are enjoying the series. I think it's really fun and we can explore many different themes but we're getting the easy ones out of the way so with fire um obviously we i always think of uh i don't have a very specific sound in mind but the only thing that really comes to mind is like the sound of maybe steam and like rising melodies i guess it's kind of the only way i can put it or sporadic wild enemies kind of like the way fire is unpredictable so anyways we should get started with a game that has fire in the title and as far as I know, it has nothing to do with fire. So let us begin. VGM Vibes 5. Reach for my hand. First song that's going to be featured on this episode is from a game called Fire Emblem Three Houses, a game that I discovered here on the channel and I've not heard much of in general. I have not heard much Fire Emblem stuff. And this one kind of took me by surprise because it was a complete deviation from what I'm used to. Uh, every time I've heard Fire Emblem has been a mixture of orchestral and really long arrangements that were really epic. And I've actually seen footage of the game since, and it also doesn't match what I saw in my head. I'm not sure the exact genre, but uh, it just didn't really like match at all in my head what was what was going on. But when I heard this song, uh, you know, like I said, I let the floodgates open with ideas. And from what I collected through the comments and everything is that this is not really fire anything except just quite simply fire emblem which is fine i thought that was okay and um yeah it just took me by surprise quite a bit but like as i said earlier this is one of those games that i know nothing about so i took a bunch of notes here you're gonna see me look to the side and uh what do we got here so this is oh the edge of dawn i should say but apparently it's um if at any point any of these things are incorrect please correct me but from what I gathered, the Edge of Dawn is a kind of the main theme of the game, and it appears in multiple sections and in multiple languages. And I think the one I heard and the one you're hearing now, I believe it was uh, the Seasons of Warfare edition. It was in English, and I think it was from a separate album too, but I could be wrong about that. And I think it's also just referred to as like Edge of Dawn as opposed to the Edge of Dawn. So it's, there's a lot of like weird intricacies, but if you play the game, you probably totally understand it, but I don't. Um, and what I was told in the uh, comments is that this is a point of view of a certain character. I don't know that character. So it seems like those lyrics are pretty personal. And uh, that's pretty cool. I've always liked uh, the POV. Uh, POV. <laughs> and oh, I thought this was really cool. Uh, the one of the commenters also said in the video for um, Edge of Dawn is that if I go back and listen to Apex of the World, a song I reacted to a long time ago, maybe like two years ago, that I would hear a motif of this, and I did. I very rarely ever go listen back to one of my old videos. I don't watch my own videos uh, unless like the unless like a song really like motive like captured me or something. And I did hear the motif, and I thought that was cool. So that sort of is leaning more towards what I read on that the Edge of Dawn is like the main theme and then maybe Three Houses uses a bunch of songs based off of that. 
because I did hear Apex of the World and it did sound like it. I heard the chord progression and everything. So thank you to that commenter. And uh, oh, it's really, really catchy. I should say that musically, the song is extremely catchy. It's on this like kind of dubstep thing, which again, I was not expecting, but apparently is more common than I think. Let me know, Fire Emblem players. And that's about it. I think it's uh, a good way to start this. And it's funny because <clears throat> like I said, when I saw that Fire Emblem was like in the voting pool, I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. The whole orchestral big sound. I totally can. There's two things that come to mind when I think of Fire Emblem, and that's fire and castles. And I didn't put him in the castles theme, but I gave him like a shadow, like a honorable mention. So when I when I when I knew it was gonna be in here, I was like, oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> so the fact that it gave me this like dubstep um, woman vocal thing, I just was like, what? But it's so catchy. It's such an earworm, and once you hear it, it's probably gonna get stuck in your head. So that is. The beginning of the list and i think we'll move on to another song that i believe from what i read also doesn't really have anything to do with fire so i'll explain that in just a bit the next song on this list is molten mine from the game sonic and the black knight released in 2009 and this one is a little interesting for a couple of reasons. This one has uh, just a lot of fun facts built into it. Uh, first of all, I just want to say that Sonic may or may not appear in this video a uh, handful of times. But the thing about Sonic and the Black Knight is that it seems sort of like this anomaly within the community, kind of like the Black Sheep. Uh, I've only heard it two times. This is the second time I ever heard this game. And apparently, from what I'm told, this is another one I don't really know much about, but I've just kind of pieced together through comments and stuff, is that this is one of two games that are like a little more story related from like old stories. And apparently this one is kind of a spin off King Arthur, that kind of thing. Um, so I did see this where it plays and it is like a, a mine, but it's like in a, in a volcanic uh, outside location and apparently it's really fast like the whole stage lasted like a minute but what was cool about it is that it starts like this behind the back and then it seems to be like a multi-camera angle game where it'll eventually turn into like a 2d giving this old school feel for old people like me like the, the nostalgic feeling of sonic i thought that was kind of cool but the whole thing about this game is that he has a weapon so it seems like there's tiny traces of like battle mechanics in there so instead of just blazing through the level there's like checkpoints and you just, I don't know if it's like in any sort of like RPG elements to it, but you're definitely like physically attacking like a, a swarm of enemies, but for just a couple of seconds and then, and then you move on. So that is very interesting because Sonic is all about getting from point A to point B pretty much as fast as possible. Um, so yeah, this one is, is kind of on the volcanic side, which also is kind of, a, there's, there's a bunch of reoccurring themes in this video, you'll see. I'm not gonna list them all, but if you can catch them, I'll, uh, I'll give hints to them, but this is one of the volcanic uh, themes. Now, what makes this song interesting, reading from the comments, full of fun facts, is that this song, from what I'm gathering, wasn't really made for this game. Because, um, well, here's, here's what I read. Apparently, this was composed by Todd Dennis, and it first appeared on a PS1 game named Black Dawn. Now, I did some research on this, but I'm not saying any of this is fact. I'm just reading what I was, what I read. And I guess like the developers liked that so much that they put that into also a game called Knockout Kings 2000 as the training mode. And then also just put it into Sonic and the Black Knight. So this song pretty much existed way before this game. But they liked it and it has this kind of general energy to it that they just kind of threw it in there. If you know more about that, let me know. But I just thought that was a pretty interesting thing. Um, so yeah. So if you're ever wondering if this song doesn't match the stage, that might be why. That might be why. But either way, Sonic and the Black Knight. I still need to hear more of this game. It's it's I, I do I do hear some Sonic here and there, but Sonic and the Black Knight is, is not something I hear too often. I think it was a Wii exclusive, if I recall correctly. Again, I'm not an expert on this one. I did not play this game. 
But anyways, the song is really cool. It has a nice rock, you know, cool energy to it. It, has, it feels very um, motivational. And that's pretty much all I can say about it. So, Sonic and the Black Knight Molten Mine was a fun one. But we move on to another iconic series in video games. Next on my fire themed episode, we have Hothead Bop, the name of the song. This confused the hell out of me, but I'm pretty sure this is correct. It is called Hothead Bop. The stage it first appears in is called Hothead Hop. <laughs> so that was kind of confusing, but I think I'm pretty sure it's correct. Uh, another game I did not play, so this is what uh, was voted. Um, so I again just pieced together comments and stuff, and I saw my reaction video and. All that, all that good stuff. So from what I can gather from that, it's from Donkey Kong Country 2. Uh, Diddy's Kong Quest. It's a pun. Not Diddy. Okay, anyways. And apparently this is from the second world called Crocodile Cauldron. I'm literally reading off my notes here. And apparently, I don't know because I, I didn't want to like spoil myself. Apparently these levels kind of repeat throughout the game. And there's a possibility that this song repeats in those. But I did not want to clarify that for myself but i know the, i know the levels repeat give or take like the lava world type stuff and uh yeah that's all i really know it's side scroller game and uh i've heard that these, these games are kind of difficult but the thing that's always interesting to me when people say that is every time i hear the difficulty in question the music is always kind of on the opposite side of that you know david wise has such a chill cool ambient way of composing and even this song which is very much heat like you can hear the heat there's there's lava like bubbling like baked into the audio so it's uh, at first i thought it was just sound effects from the game which technically they are but i heard that was to save space on the what was this was this a cartridge i'm not sure but either way they save space by adding like the the, the lava bubbles into the song itself uh, but even then, the song has this kind of calm nature to it, and then eventually goes into an even more calm nature. So it's it's a little peaceful, but I don't know. Like, I saw the way the game plays. It looks like pretty much, like, tough platforming, I guess I would say. It doesn't seem too crazy for someone like me. I don't want to, like, jinx myself, but I grew up with, like, Crash Bandicoot and stuff, so I never really minded platforming. Um, hopefully I don't, like, shoot myself in the foot if I ever play these one day, but... Uh, apparently, you know, they're somewhat difficult, whatever. <laughs> but it's just always funny when I hear that because the music is so calm. Everything is so cool and collected in Donkey Kong stuff. And some of my favorite music I've heard on the channel has been from David Wise. David Wise himself has appeared multiple times in the VG and Vibe series and not always Donkey Kong. I did um, uh, a Mickey's Game Boy game in the last episode for Castles and that was him too. Just a legend in the field and someone that I missed out on because I didn't grow up with Nintendo. So hearing him very late into my life, I can very much understand how people consider him a legend and rightfully so. I am a huge fan of the bass and a lot of bass is in David Wise's music, especially in this song. Doo -doo 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 is there anything else I wrote? Uh, that's, that's pretty much it. So I don't... Uh, don't have experience with these games. I know you guys do for sure. And uh, I just, I reacted to it a long time ago. And I remember it, it did kind of stay with me because of the bass. And anytime, honestly, anytime Nintendo comes around, it, it seems to stick with, with me just a little bit longer. And that's it. So that's the second lava infused kind of song, Magma, I guess. But um, speaking of which, we're going to keep going on with that theme into this next song. Up next, we have a little game called Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance. This song is called Lava Shrine. This one was so interesting to me because I had to think back of songs that I've heard and this is one that was not voted on. This is one of my suggestions. But even then, I still, I learned some stuff doing this because when I played these games, I was a kid. I didn't care about learning stuff back then. I just played them. And I wasn't really too big on the lore. I didn't even really think at the time Mortal Kombat had lore. I just, 
you know, did the combos and just did the stuff like everyone else did as, as a kid. So for the Lavish rule, actually, let me talk about Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance, which in itself has a little bit of history for me. Um, for one thing, it was the the first of the, I guess, the th mm, I don't want to say the 3D era, but kind of, if you consider it like that. Basically, the way I see it is the first four games, the ones that like took over the world, they all came out pretty much right after each other. One, then two, and then three, and then four. They pretty much dominated the 90s from the early 90s to like 95, 96, something like that. And then they just kind of stopped. And then there was, you know, a lot of questionable side games and stuff like that. So when Deadly Alliance was announced, this came out in 2002. So there was a big break, you know. Now we're on. Now they're on home consoles. Uh, you know, this one went straight to the home console as opposed to the other Canon games, which were arcade uh, arcade standups. So it was a big deal, right? It was like, ooh, PS2, you know, all that stuff. And it was a big deal because uh, they introduced, as you can see here, a sort of uh, multi fighting style kind of thing. And each character had three fighting styles, so it was like two legitimate martial arts. So it looked very professional and grown up. I'm like, they're like, whoa, they actually like got real martial arts in there. So the motion capture was really impressive. And then the third stance was like a weapon. So you can actually see here between these two characters, Scorpion is in uh, a leopard stance, and then Nitara here is uh, has a weapon. So yeah, at any point you can cycle between the three. So it gave a lot of variety. You just adjust to you know whatever your character is dealing with so it's pretty cool but also the music of of this era this was kind of for me i can go on a huge tangent about this but for me this was kind of like the last of the time where mk music was good i will die on this hill but uh, i'm very opinionated on this and passionate about this that's a whole other thing but this was kind of like around the time where it this was like the last of its good soundtracks Music since the 3D era, so like Mortal Kombat 9 onwards to where we're at now, has been, in my opinion, very disappointing, very ambient, and very non-existent when the music sounded like this and, you know, the first four games sounded like, it's like night and day. So, regarding the Lava Shrine, there's a couple things I learned. I had to look up into the, the wikis and apparently, I, I always thought this stage was just kind of whatever it was just like a just a background stage you know it's cool basically it's an arena with lava all around it and there's a huge egg in the background which you can see and upon reading what it is this is actually pretty cool because this is teasing the next game i had no idea that egg hosts uh basically the next game's final boss so they were teasing the whole time and i had no idea i don't think anyone had any idea that there was going to be a Dragon King, but that was pretty cool. Looking back on it now, because I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, that makes total sense. And um, there was also kind of an Easter egg with when you f get into this part of the game, you're actually facing a guardian of this egg known as Blaze, who's kind of an Easter egg as well, who's also kind of a boss later. There's, there's way more lore than I thought there would be here. But uh, basically the music, what's cool about this one is that it's one of the few in the whole list that has an electronic side. If you ever saw the Mortal Kombat movie, the good one, the first one, the that soundtrack, if that made an impression on you, a lot of that is here. There's a lot of that, you know, techno, side trance kind of thing, and it's just really, really cool. It really pumps you up. And it, to me, it's just really nostalgic, and I really miss that side of uh, the music from MK. It's, you know, something I, I... Like, if you guys didn't know, MK was some of the first music... I ever heard in video game history with MK1 and it left it a huge impression on me so although I don't really play it anymore or anything it still you know holds a special place you know I remember the announcement trailer for Deadly Alliance and everything was such a cool big idea and then in the first opening scene of the game like something drastic happens I don't want to spoil it but it's so it's so intense you know but anyways so, Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance, Lava Shrine, super underrated in my opinion. The stage never came back, the song never came back. Although, fun fact, I learned, I don't know if this is true, but I kind of confirmed it in, on my own, that this song sounds like a remix 
from Mortal Kombat 3's The Bridge. And if you listen to him closely, kind of, kind of, I don't know if it's intentional. The settings are completely different and everything, and it wouldn't make sense, but chord-wise, pretty, pretty close. Anyways, we move on to another one of my childhood favorite games and something I never covered here or yet on the Vibe series or on the channel. I'm so excited to finally talk about it because it's super dark and twisted and horrible. We finally get to talk about the game I grew up with called Twisted Metal. In this case, Twisted Metal Black, one of the most memorable games i think in my entire life in video game history for so many reasons uh let's just talk about this song really quick this is minion stadium from twisted metal black composed by kevin Manthe, who you may know as a composer for invader zim which i wouldn't know because i never seen invader zim but i confirmed that with them as i emailed them for a response because there's not a lot of information when it comes to twisted metal black i looked through all the credits and there's so many so much conflicting information uh, just, just so you guys understand, like how Twisted Metal works. The first one, two, three, four, four games. I would say this. Was, I don't know if this is considered five, but the first four games were all like licensed music, mostly by Rob Zombie, stuff like that. You know, it was just all like stuff like that. And I don't know for certain, but I'm pretty sure Black was the first time it was like an original soundtrack, and it sounds like it. You know, there's a lot of dark really messed up sounds think of like from soft it's you know big like orchestral kind of creepy arrangements but yeah so it, it stood out but before i get into the song I, twisted metal black if you guys have never heard of this game uh basically twisted metal is just a vehicle combat battle royale so before battle royales were even cool uh, the purpose was you have these cars which all have characters in them so not only so the, so the cars have their own names and their host also have their own names and sometimes the host you know gets changed but the car always has their own identity and the premise of these games are always so simple there's a tournament run by calypso very uh evil person who grants you a wish any wish of any kind uh, upon completing the tournament that's how like the story goes and usually the end of that the result of that wish always gets twisted he twists the words so it's like a kind of comical thing. He kind of screws you over all the time. And Minion was the original first boss, but since then has always became uh, like a sub boss or like a midway boss kind of thing. And he's a demon from hell. So that's the whole fire thing here. The fire thing is he's a demon from hell and his special move from the cars that he always, uh, he always like rode a tank or a big, in this case, it was a big like trailer truck of death but it was always like a tank. And his thing was that he shot like a fireball with ice and a missile. So it was like three specials at once. It was pretty pretty overpowered. Anyways, so the premise of Twisted Metal Black was really adult. This game is like very visceral and dark. There's a lot of really dark themes. They embraced the mature rating. Uh, if you have the stomach for it and want to spend like an hour just hearing some really messed up crap, you can look up the Twisted Metal stories of all the characters, which have a uh, prologue, a middle section, which is always after you beat Minion, and then the epilogue, and they're all messed up. Those stories, like, got... They're, they're, like, stuck in my head from how messed up they are. And I would love to one day see... Uh, I don't think anyone's ever done it, but I would, I would love to see people's reaction to those things. You know how, like, reactionary content can kind of, like, once something gets popular and then a bunch of people start doing it. I think if someone one day discovers that Twisted Metal Black reactionary content could be a thing, it could blow up. Maybe it's just a, a dream of mine, but it's uh, it's really crazy stuff and don't watch it with your kids, seriously. <laughs> so um, that being said, <laughs> another thing about Twisted Metal Black is you might've heard of a game called God of War. It's the same director, David Jaffe. And this was the return of David Jaffe. So Twisted Metal 1 and 2 were him. And those were, you know, highly praised games, especially 2. 3 he left and people started to realize the quality dropped. 4 he wasn't there. So when he came back for Black, it was like a big deal. And man, that he just like knock it out of the park. I think he's still doing stuff. He might have like opened up his, new, his own studio or something like that. 
He's still involved. I think he even streams too. I don't know entirely, but uh, was there anything else I'm forgetting? Basically, just the song. I guess I should talk about the song. Uh, it's really, really like demonic. It sounds like you're like you're burning in somewhere not you should be burning. The sky is completely blood red, as you can kind of see here. So the whole, and uh, basically, Minion is like a sub boss. He's the middle interlude of the story. It's very difficult. He's a. It's just a one on one. Usually, when you're fighting these, it's like an arcade ladder, right? You fight with a bunch of uh, other cars. But when it's minion, it's always one-on-one. -on -one. So it's just whatever car you have in this gigantic trailer of death. <laughs> and that's it. And there's more I want to talk about minion, but there's, it's kind of like spoiling it. But either way, I, should, I would just look into Twisted Metal Black. It's, pr it's a pretty cult classic, and it, it stayed with me forever because it gave me nightmares. And I'm not joking about that. So uh, I haven't played any of the games since Black. I think they've, call I think they've kind of fallen off from what I've heard. They don't really have that same luster. But what would really be cool though, by the way, just as a side note here, is even though the trend of battle royales has kind of died off, they could really do, it, it would be so cool to see like a Twisted Metal battle royale because it is a battle royale, it's the last man standing. I think that'd be really, really cool. Although I don't know if there's enough cars for it, but anyways, that was my, <laughs> my nerdum into Twisted Metal. And I'm glad I can talk about it here. That's kind of the, one of the reasons I did the Vibe series. But when I think of Fire, for sure, Minion, absolutely, he's a demon from hell. And this song has Fire written all over it. And this game is freaky as hell. But we're going to keep talking about games from my childhood. So up next, we have the return of A Little Blue Hedgehog. We return with some more Sonic with kind of two games here. We have Sonic and Knuckles, or Sonic 3. I'll explain that in a bit. And also Sonic Mania. So first things first, this is uh, Lava Reef Act 1 and 2. This was <laughs> this was my suggestion for a Sonic uh, video before uh, a bunch of votes came in for other Sonic songs. So this was my contribution. But anyways, I discovered Lava Reef two years ago. <laughs> through Act 2 from Sonic Mania. All right, let's, let's, let's follow along here. Two years ago, I reacted to Lava Reef Act 2 from Sonic Mania, composed by, or arranged by T. Lopez. And that song stood out so hard to me. It sounded like a Top Gun movie soundtrack. The guitars are so cool and just elegant. Wow, wow, wow. It's, it's, as soon as you hear it, it's, it's got staying power. So <clears throat> while I was getting ready for this episode, I completely forgot. I was like, wait a minute, there's still other, you know, I know how Sonic works is always, I don't know if they ever did more than two acts, I guess two acts and a boss, but the game always has, has always had for, for what I think I know, the, the early games in act one and in act two. So it's the same stage, different design and a different song variants. So I was like, well, it wouldn't make sense if I did this video and I only heard act two. So I, I decided to hear the rest of them. So I recently just reheard Act One from Mania, which is the homage 25th anniversary of Sonic game. Pretty sure I did not play. I did not play Mania, but originally I, I found out that this, these were from Sonic and Knuckles, which came out uh, in '94. <laughs> so Sonic. 3 slash Sonic and Knuckles, I'm not gonna get into that, but basically it was an expansion. Uh, from what I'm told, the game Sonic 3 came out a little too early and Sonic and Knuckles was kind of like the complete version and then you can like even like attach your like cartridge to the top of it or something like that. I, I've never seen it in action, but I've always heard of that. Anyways, um, I never finished 3. I only played the first level of 3. Not <laughs> one, I didn't know that actually. A long time ago, I thought that I got pretty far in 3, but I didn't. I only did the first level because once I started hearing more songs from 3, I pretty much found out I never really experienced 3 whatsoever. So, Lava Reef Act 1 and 2 is originally from Sonic & Knuckles. Uh, or Sonic 3, I guess. It's, it's, it's kind of confusing. But either way, the whole song takes place uh, inside a volcano, which is really cool. So you'll see a lot of... A lot of... Uh, lava everywhere you'll see lava waterfalls especially the boss 
It's pretty cool. There's a, it's like the whole backdrop is lava. It's just completely engulfed. And uh, I took some notes here because, like I said, I didn't play this. But, oh, dude. This whole... The thing about Lava Reef that I really liked is I already fell in love with Act 2 of Mania. But when I heard Act 2 of the original, it sounds so different. I still like it too, but it sounds so different. It's wild how much T. Lopez kind of transformed Act 2, but still kept the... I don't even know how to explain it. It just sounds good. Like, you get you get more bang for your buck. You can get another way of hearing it. Um, from what I'm told, didn't look into this, but when T. Lopez did Sonic Mania, he wanted to keep... Like, he wanted to keep a faithfulness to Act 1 songs and then change it up for 2. Let me know if that sounds correct. But I could see that because... Lava Reef Act 2 from Mania sounds completely different from Act 2 from the original. But then we go on to uh, Act 1, which both of them sound kind of similar. So that, that checks out. But Act 1 is super catchy. It's super catchy. It's got that like bass that I know from Sonic. The sound of Sonic that I grew up with. Sonic was also one of the first soundtracks I ever heard in video game history. Getting my interest in video games. So along with Mortal Kombat, I had Sonic 1 and... You can bet that I heard Sonic 1 soundtrack like crazy my whole life. Green Hill Zones, Starlight, you know, all that. I still have, um, what's the, uh, oh god. Every time I need to think of something in the clutch, it never comes in. It'll, it'll always come later. Um, Chemical Plant, yes. Chemical Plant, that song. I remember hearing that for the first time and I just like froze in my tracks. But anyways. This is one of those confusing things. I, I did as much research as I can on this one, but when it comes to Sonic 3 and Sonic and & Knuckles, there's a, there's a lot of confusion with composers. So it's like safe to just say the Sega sound team because there's like a lot of people. It's, it's kind of hard to narrow down who did what, like if someone did a particular song or if there was a lot of collaboration, then there's the whole Michael Jackson involvement thing. So it's really just a, it's, kind of convoluted but either way very complex things i'm talking about but the songs lava reef zone act one and two from both games let me know if it came back in another game but as far as i know it's only in these two uh fantastic funky catchy songs involving being inside a volcano and it's awesome you know flamethrower stuff all over the place i love it i love this whole feel of sonic it's like this feel i know and T. Lopez did an amazing job on Act 2, which got me even interested in even putting the song in here. So seriously, I really love Act 2 of, of Mania. It's amazing. Like Those guitars are crying. So <laughs> a lot of themes here, a lot of lava, a lot of all that. But we are now going to move on to something very related to lava, and that is magma. Ah uh, yes, we can talk about Hades and Darren Korb. The song, uh, the song is called "River of Flame," and it is one of the few songs you hear in the second biome of Asphodel, as you can see right here. So this is the only roguelike game I've ever played. I played it very recently this year, and it was it shot up to one of my most favorite games I've ever played. It was extremely fun. I love the challenge, the replayability, the voice acting the like 20,000 lines of dialogue, the music, what else? I mean, the whole thing, the Greek mythology everywhere. The I, I learned about Zagreus who I never even knew about. Uh, basically, long story short, you are taking, uh, you are Zagreus, the son of Hades, and your goal is to get out and see mother. And uh, you go through a couple of biomes. You start off in Tartarus into Asphodel, and then to Elysium, into the River Styx, and everything else is kind of a spoiler. But basically, it's a it's a really fun game that I highly recommend. It's from Supergiant, my only Supergiant games game. And uh, it's usually on sale, so I think if you ever want a challenge, and if you're not even into it, you might be surprised by it, because I was. It's a really fun game, and if, if you really like 
Uh, no two runs are the same because there's a lot of RNG with like what you can pick up and stuff. I really, really enjoyed it. I got some friends into the game and they really enjoyed it. Really cool to uh, have like a, a challenge that you know you can't beat at first, but as but you will get better and you know beating that uh, ultimate boss is just so satisfying. It's so so satisfying. So. This is um, the second biome. The first one is Tartarus, which has very little. It's pretty straightforward. Um, just a you know couple of undead enemies and stuff, but not a lot of stage traps. Just a couple of spikes that come out of the wall and stuff. But Asphodel is when things kind of heat up. <laughs> uh, there is magma all over the place, so there are stage hazards everywhere. Yeah, so this game is really reliant on the dash. It's kind of your evade and the, like your defense, really. So if you da if you get too crazy with the dash, you're gonna end up you know burning. So the th the thing with the music in this section, Hades has a lot of rock, progressive sort of electronic, pulsating rhythms, and a lot of sounds that are inspired by the theremin. Even though I've confirmed that it is not the theremin, it is a Casio SK1 keyboard to make it sound like a theremin. So a lot of long notes all over the place and a lot of the songs are very inspired by Greek and Turkish rhythms a lot of the instruments are Greek and Turkish for example there's the lapta the baglama and the bazooki which you're gonna hear all over this song pretty cool it's got like a if you ever heard of like a 12 string guitar it sounds something similar to that these instruments that have like double strings on them so it has a bit of a some harmonies with them Asphodel is really cool too because you also get a sub-story with uh, Eurydice and Orpheus if you're familiar with that, but I won't spoil it. And it also has the Barge of Death, a very unique part of the game with uh, a boat. And the thing about the songs though, about for Asphodel, is that they're very droney and long. Like this one for example, River of Flame is almost 10 minutes, basically 10 minutes, and it takes a while for it to start. There's a lot of just... Dun, 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 dun. What I can best describe this music as is like very build up, slow burn, like steam, kind of just like slowly rising to an eventual kind of like lift off. And that's what these songs sound like, especially River of Flame. Uh, the other similar song, like a brother song to this one would be Through Asphodel, which by the way, um, I did a whole top 20 video of the music of Hades if you're interested in that. So I, I ranked all my favorite songs from Hades. And yeah, it was it was my first time uh, playing a Darren Korb game, and man, is he involved. He's the composer. He's the main character's voice. Uh, he does voices for other people. He's just uh, he's he's pretty inspiring when it comes to working in game development, and he seems really really cool and down to earth. And I just I don't know. I just I've seen a lot of videos where like they do behind the scenes, and Darren just seems like the coolest dude. Pretty much ever. And the only other thing I should say about this song is that it's one of the oddball songs in this list that have a 5-4 time signature. So it's going to sound very different. But if you can count to 5-4 time signature, you can follow along with the song. And the only way I can describe that is if you don't know, that is very simple. Everyone here has heard their entire lives 4-4, four, four, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3. Just think of this song playing if you're playing along with it as like one two three four five one two three four five so the whole thing just repeats like that it's a little odd and very it, it doesn't really flow as naturally as you would think because it's an odd time signature but uh a lot of a, a lot of hades music has odd time signatures so you might you might have wondered why some of it sounds kind of like it's a little off in the rhythm that's why anyways hades Super fun, an amazing time, loaded with good music, but of course we can't talk about fire and magma and all that without speaking of Asphodel, it's pretty, pretty much on brand there. So we're going to actually continue this whole magma and lava thing in the next song with a song that is a super big deal for many reasons. Up next, we have Heat Haze Shadow from Tekken 7. Although this song exists in two forms, as Heat Haze Shadow 1 
or first and EDH Shadow 2 or second. But if you can find a mix of the songs together, I think that's where it shines. This one is uh, a little bit of a spoiler, so if you wanted to play Tekken 7. Uh, but it's kind of not a spoiler at the same time because it's kind of a meme and a re reoccurring story that's been there since forever. Uh, the story of Kazuya and uh, Heihachi Mishima. Uh, father and son. They hate each other. They're always fighting. They have killed each other multiple times. <laughs> it's uh, they they like to throw each other off cliffs, and just keep coming back. So that's kind of like the premise. And Heat Haze Shadow is a song that plays during the final encounter <laughs> of uh, Tekken 7's story. And there's nothing more epic than beating up your family on top of a volcano with lava blowing everywhere and. All that stuff. But the thing that's cool about this one is that this song is playing as a kind of interactive fight. And what I mean by that is it starts off as a cutscene and then they kind of blend and it goes right into the fight and then all of a sudden you're in the fight of uh, the stage which is called Brimstone and Fire. And you know after a certain amount, you know like an RPG is just like if you, you don't have to hit the, the health bar all the way but like after you get to a certain point like a ch a ch something happens. In this case, the cutscene resumes, and then it happens again, and just keeps resuming like that. So it's it's interactive in that regard. Pretty cool. And that's how He Haze 1 and 2 come to be. Speaking of He Haze Shadow 2, things get interesting here, because I did not know this until I did research for this. He Haze Shadow 2 features vocals from Nami Nakagawa, who you may know for as one of the vocals from Nier Automata, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, some of my favorite music from Nier Automata, most notably Possessed by Disease, it features Nami Nakagawa, and her vocals are all over this one. But speaking of, another uh, legend in the music department is uh, Ajurika, who composed this song. Ajurika is kind of a legend in music, uh, mostly Namco titles, but especially Tekken. Some of my favorite music from the Tekken series comes from this person. For example, there is a song that one day I hopefully get to talk about here, and I would love to, and that's Electric Fountain from Tekken 6, otherwise known as Karma. If you know video game music from fighting games, you know Electric Fountain. <laughs> Holy crap, that's also Ajurika. But also, uh, the game after that, which was Tekken Tag 2, there's an amazing song called Plucking Tulips from the Tulip Festival. That's also Ajurika. Incredible, incredible stuff. This man knows how to make some really memorable like psytrance stuff and it's honestly amazing including heat hey shadow so is there anything else i missed oh yes doing research for this song apparently this song is also in smash which doesn't surprise me but i have no idea that's kind of cool uh, i would love to someday hear that but i have not i guess it makes sense because uh, i'm pretty sure kazuya is in smash i don't know about heihachi but yeah what else did I write down? Um, oh, yes. I don't know for certain, but I believe this is the last appearance of uh, Unsho Ishizuka as Heihachi, as he passed away uh, after after Tekken 7 came out. Legendary voice actor. I think he's also in Yakuza as well. Very deep, menacing voice that I, that I loved. And um, he... Uh, yeah, he passed away shortly after this, and I don't know who they replaced him with because they just, for me recording this, they just announced Heihachi's return in the, in the latest game, so. Yeah, um, I think it goes without saying, but Tekken music is iconic for a reason. There's multiple composers, and they're all amazing at it, but um, he, Hey Shadow has always been kind of a standout, and in many ways, a lot of people will consider it kind of one of the main themes for Tekken 7. But it's uh, for a good reason. Watch the cutscene. It's pretty epic. Pretty epic. We're going to move away from the lava, volcanoes, and magma stuff into just straight uh, burning and turmoil and pain in the next song coming up right now. Next song on my list is from a game called Final Fantasy XIV, the MMO of Final Fantasy this is As the Sky Burns from, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, from the Endwalker expansion. 
I just reacted to the song not too long ago. It was voted for. So this is one of those that I don't know and then I just kind of piece together with comments. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what's the meaning here of Vanaspati. I'm guessing that's the location and I would have to assume Ilzabard is another location, maybe like the country it's in or something. You guys tell me, but either way, this is the theme of that place. And from what I gathered, well, I'll talk about the story in a bit, but uh, the music, I would say this music is pretty much on brand of what I think fire sounds like. This, this, you guys kind of nailed it on this one. This was the, uh, this one was voted as well. And man, it's, uh, I saw the footage for it when I was reacting to it and I'll get to that in a bit, but man, the, the sound of it was it just very much, not only did it sound like turmoil, it is but it, it definitely has that sound i can't explain it but it just has a sound of fire to me so this is pretty much like on brand with what goes through my mind when i think of heat flames combustion all that kind of stuff so uh congrats on nailing that one but i took some notes here um basically what i got from this was that it's kind of like a village of decay it's a uh, urgency and panic personified there's a lot of uh really sad events going on uh ba basically uh, spoilers i guess i don't know if you haven't played Endwalker, but i'm just throwing that out there i should have said that but it's uh yeah you're you're basically i guess trying to like well, well you're trying to save this is what i'm i'm guessing from what i collected you're trying to save people from this town but there is no saving them like it's too late you just just have to see it happen you know that kind of thing it's too late and that's pretty devastating Everything sounds like it's slowly just going to turn into ash. And the whole song is covered in these uh, this Indian atmosphere. Apparently the location kind of looks like that too. I don't remember that, but the sounds I do remember. Uh, a lot of flutes, a lot of hand percussion, very Indian inspired. But I did learn something really cool and it's something I've always wanted to know. Is there's this really famous Indian instrument that you always hear in movies and stuff. But I always wanted to know what it was. I never knew what it was. And someone left a comment, and I'm pretty sure this is actually it because I saw some videos for it. But the instrument is called a, a bansuri, or a bamboo flute. It's a side flute, and it is it is that it sounds exactly like that sound, that kind of really breathy wood-like sound that's all over this. I I can finally say that I'm pr I'm pretty sure at least that it is the bansuri that I've been hearing my whole life. So I thought that was really really cool. But another thing I really, really liked about this song is that it's a, it's it's not what I typically hear on the channel. Final Fantasy XIV is one of my most popular videos on the channel. It'll always get a lot of people watching it. It's one of the big communities that found me first before I even was like anybody. You know, the Final Fantasy XIV crowd like took me under their wing. And I've done about 80 videos for it, which is crazy for it's crazy for me, and it's also crazy because it's like nothing near of what the soundtrack even holds. <laughs> so one day I'll, you know, hear them all. Maybe not. I don't know. So, but for what was what, what was interesting to me is that I've always heard boss themes, really energetic stuff. You know, all the big hits that people want me to hear. I understand. But to me, I really resonate with this kind of stuff that's not so popular. Maybe like the town themes and the the zone stuff. And I really like that stuff that's even though even though it's repetitive and it loops quite a bit. I like that, though. I like that world building. So I feel like I just scratched the surface with 14 music because I've heard even though a lot of those 80 songs that I checked out, I think most of those were like boss themes. So I feel like I'm just getting started. <laughs> so I cannot wait to actually hear more stuff like this because it, it really paints the picture and brings the whole world together for me. And I think that's all I had to say about it. But apparently it's just a really dark section of the story here. But I just wanted to say how much it nails the fire vibes. And just as a side Easter egg, there is a huge hint I just threw in there that no one caught. I know it, of the number one song that's going to be in this video. <laughs> and you won't know it, you won't guess it until uh, it comes into into that one. But I just wanted to throw that in there uh, when you rewind and hear this part again. Anyways, 
It is As the Sky Burns from Final Fantasy XIV, a song of turmoil and just being kind of in a horrible place. But that kind of segues into the next song about being into horrible places, uh, somewhere you don't want to be, and more turmoil and more death. So that is coming up next. The debut of Monster Hunter on the VGM Vibe series. Monster Hunter World Iceborne. This is the theme of Fatalis, uh, which has, I think, it's like a huge sweep. So it's like a big, long fight. I think I've seen some places where it's called uh, the Legend Descends. Let me know if that's correct, or maybe that's just one of the phases. But anyways, the Fatalis medley. Um, this song is special for a lot of reasons, uh, mainly before I get to the song. Whew, okay, um, I consider this video kind of an important part for me because this was to me one of the turning points in my auditorium because up until this point, Monster Hunter World, um, I don't have a better word for this and I, don't, and I don't mean it, but work with me here. Up until this point, Monster Hunter World was borderline kind of boring to me, the music, and it's because I can't think of a better word for it. But in reality, all that meant was I was always very transparent with Monster Hunter music is that I just didn't get it. It seemed it's, it just seemed very atmospheric and ambient and just kind of like generic orchestral mush. And I'm not saying that as a bad thing, but when it comes to that specific music, that music really, really shines as you're playing the game. So I always said, man, I really wish I can get the context here. I really wish I can because I do love that music as it's happening. And I still feel that way. Because uh, I do get a lot of orchestral stuff sometimes. And while it's great and talented and beautiful and like great music, it's just a different thing. You know, you just, you just have to be there. And I always felt that way really strongly about Monster Hunter. But this time, I felt like this time things changed for me. And Fatalis felt like a, like I went over the hump. Yeah, I still had no context. I had a little video that I watched for like five seconds prior. But even after that, it was just pictures. So I still was missing a lot of it. But I felt, I felt the power of the song. And that's where I started to get excited because now I went from kind of... Not... How do I say this? I pretty much, from this point onwards, I got excited about Monster Hunter. Let's put it that way. So every time I see Monster Hunter now, I'm like, ooh, you know, what, what, you know, what pits of hell am I going to now? You know, it's so, the music is so intense in Monster Hunter. This song right here, this medley, I'm pretty sure it has to be at least in like top three of all my reactions of most intense music. As in pure, visceral, like, grandiose, scary noises. And that's without me hearing the sound effects and everything. Just the song is like a screeching death trap, it sounds like to me. <laughs> so I wanted to say all that before I even talk about the song. Because again, I have not experienced this game. This is one that I collected through the comments and just try to get an idea of what it is. But that was my experience with the Vitalis medley and it's uh, it, it made an impact. Fire Breathing Dragon, that's, the, that's how he's made it here. So from what I collected, Correct me on any of these. I just I did as much research as I can. I think, I think, the game is from 2018, and then, no, sorry. Oh God. Yeah. So I think I think the game was from 2018. Iceborne was 2019, and Fatalis was released in 2020. So I think the song came out in 2020, but I've been told that Fatalis has a bunch of motifs throughout the entire series in the song of course i'm not going to pick those up but i think that's another reason people like the song so much is because if you are a longtime fan of monster hunter then this was like a total treat to you and i'm jealous of that because i see you see what i mean like i can't I, I won't understand that i can just hear the song at face value but i won't get any of those little treats with it so let me so confirm that with me if that's true which i'm pretty sure it is 
Second, it was very hard to find any composer information on this one. It's so scattered because technically composers of old motifs are in here. So that's why at the list you'll see I just put a bunch. I just put like, I, I did find like the booklet of the game. And the, it has all the official composers in there. So I just threw them all in there. So uh, if, if, you, if someone out there knows precisely who arranged this one, then by all means. But I just put everyone that was involved with Monster Hunter World Iceborne. Now, speaking of this boss and everything, this is what I got from the comments. Apparently, it's the final boss, another theme in this video, and it is a uh, a very, let's just say, challenging experience. So, from what I get, it's uh, it has a lot of one shot attacks. So, no matter how beefed up you are, how leveled you are, whatever, this thing can still. Uh, zap you in one hit. It has the most HP and I think you only have a 30 minute time limit to beat him as opposed to the normal 50. Again, these are me just reading comments. Either way, it already sounds like it's a nightmare to fight against. So, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Like the, it was, it was a mixture of this song sounds so intense and it just sounds to me like honestly what hell sounds like. If I can imagine the moment Someone steps into the underworld. <laughs> These first notes start playing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's a multi-face thing. You know, there's like, there's mounted themes, which I learned about too. It's like a, I guess like a mini game where you can kind of topple the enemy. This is a lot about, uh, there's a lot about Monster Hunter, I don't know. But uh, I've kind of pieced together some things. But basically what I gathered is this is a fan favorite. It's, I, I believe, has to be one of my favorites from Monster Hunter. I don't know if it is, but... It, it definitely is up there. One of the most memorable. And for me, one of the, 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 the turning point of when I started to really enjoy Monster Hunter, despite not having context, I, I really just, something about it, I just it just clicked with me right there that this is really impressive, really intense music that is some of the most intense video game music I think that is out there. So, yeah. That's uh, that's pretty much it. Is there anything else I'm forgetting here? Oh, yeah, this is going to be... There's a lot of themes here, like I said. There's final boss themes. There's others. See if you can catch them on. And uh, this will be one of the... Let's just say this will be one of the few Capcom games that are going to be here. But not the next one. The next one is going to be something that's very near and dear to me. My favorite game of all time. <laughs> so... In the meantime, this was Monster Hunter World Iceborne, Fatalis, the final boss, the legend descends, and super iconic to me. The Blast Furnace from Metal Gear Solid 1, I guess, just call it Metal Gear Solid. Uh, when I first put this song on here, I, I thought I was going to make like a really big tangent on this one because I can talk about my favorite game for quite a while but I'll keep this one brief because the area that it's in is quite brief too but I just did wanted to mention some things this is the second time Metal Gear Solid appears they appeared in the battle themes and this is a kind of iconic area for me because uh, if you don't want to be spoiled you should probably stop listening now but this was the first game I ever played that was two discs and this is the beginning of disc two so Basically, the lead up to this, you just did, I'm not even gonna hint at it, but something really big just happened. And then you walk down these stairs and then you hear the game over sound and you're like, wait, what happened? And then it says, insert disc two, so iconic. And it's scary, right? You gotta like open your PlayStation, take out the disc and put the next one in. I'll never forget that, I'll never forget that. And then as soon as uh, you click start, Blast Furnace starts playing. Like it starts like fading in. It's just like, it's perfect. The Blast Furnace is a uh, tiny little area, the beginning of disc two, where uh, as you can see, there's just like all this molten smelting material and all that stuff. But uh, it really reminded me quite a bit of the Terminator 2 ending, which everybody's seen, if you know what I'm talking about with the, <laughs> this, this place is like that. If you can imagine the Terminator 2 ending, this is what the blast furnace is. It's just like the same thing, factory, moving machine parts and all that. And um, 
it's a, it's a really small area, but it is the epitome of heat and all that stuff because there's a section where you have to kind of crawl really low because there's these pipes that are blowing hot steam at you and the whole thing is just engulfed in hotness. It's one of the few areas where you can kind of throw enemies into a hazard, in this case that down there, and they can just uh, turn into ash. <laughs> the, the thing about the song is that it's uh, it's very it's very simple. It's very atmospheric. It's it's the feeling of heat for this one. So we got like a, a like a kind of haunting chorus, metallic clinging sounds. There's a lot of motifs. Well, I don't even know if you call them motifs, but there's a lot of sound effects in the Metal Gear Solid soundtrack that you hear constantly throughout the songs, like little whistles and little dings and stuff like that, like little whistles and just kind of just a bunch of little things. And the song has that too. Sound effects, I guess you can just put it. Uh, and that's it, really. It's just an iconic section of such an amazing game to me. It's arguably one of the most important video games of my life. And I, anytime I can talk about it, it's such a treat, but it's uh, not a whole lot happens here, but it is a memorable section because of a couple things. For one, like what, what you're doing right there is just, you know, a really cool thing. There's not a lot of sections in the game where you're kind of up against the wall and you have to walk and avoid something, which fun fact, you don't even have to, you don't even have to duck that thing. You can just blow it up. But <laughs> it's just a memorable spot because of the whole disc two thing is so iconic to me and I just love the way the blast furnace sounds. It sounds just I don't know, it sounds hot. <laughs> you know? So anytime I can talk about Snake and MGS, it's just a good time for me. And I think a lot of people agree with me that uh just one of the coolest moments in gaming history is just playing Metal Gear Solid. Go play Metal Gear Solid. It's pretty cool. It holds up. Although the graphics may not have, but there's uh there's solutions to that. Anyways we're gonna talk about more games from my childhood with now a character that is pretty much the definition of heat and fire and possibly the most famous fire related character in gaming question mark theme of Ken Masters of Street Fighter, one of the most iconic fighting games on the planet, and everybody knows Ken, Ken and Ryu's longtime rivalry, and Ken, when, when, I, when I ever think of like fighting game characters and anything fire related, I always think of two, Scorpion, who was also featured earlier, and Ken. Although I found out, I could be wrong about this, but there's a lot, you have to remember, there's a lot of Street Fighter games out there. Uh, I, I think that the debut of the actual fire emanating from his attacks came in Super Street Fighter 2, the new challengers. So he was already in, he was there from the beginning, he was in the first game. But it wasn't until Super Street Fighter 2 where uh, he would start having fire attacks like the Shoryuken, which by the way means Rising Dragon Fist, if you did not know. Every time he's like, Shoryuken. Um, ironically enough, he doesn't have the... Uh, the fireball. He has a Hadouken, but uh, he. I, I, I was. I was confused that as a kid. I'm like, why does he have a fireball? But that goes to Akuma and Ryu. Anyways, Ken, obviously from America. The whole thing about Street Fighter is that these characters are fighting from all over the world, and USA's representative has always been Ken. Uh, really cool. Very uh, hot-headed, brash character. All of his moves and kicks uh, as the games go on have like very huge emphasis on on uh, fire, like the Shorty Repa and all that, it's pretty cool. And uh, you might have noticed at the beginning of the song that it was uh, Yoko Shimomura, which I knew about actually for a long time, but I did not know until this video that that was under the alias of Shimo P. That was her thing, I guess, back then. So Yoko Shimomura obviously needs no introduction. She has been around video game music forever, Kingdom Hearts, Final Fantasy, uh, you know things, they know Blade. But uh, she did also do Street Fighter's iconic music, including Guile's theme. A lot of the thing, the thing about Street Fighter music is that it's so iconic that most of the games, not all of them, most of the games keep those themes that she created and just do remixes of them since, even still to this day. So 
Uh, that's pretty. That's pretty powerful, if you ask me. But speaking of which, this one's kind of tricky, though. A lot of people may not know this, but Ken Steam is actually almost like a direct influence from another song from Cheap Trick, off of the Top Gun soundtrack. It's called Mighty Wings. If you go listen to Mighty Wings from Cheap Trick, you will hear Ken Steam in the first five seconds. So it's like directly inspired, you know. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence either. It sounds almost identical. The, um, what was I was gonna say? Oh yeah, so obviously this is the second fighting game here. Um, wait, third, it's the third one. Mortal Kombat, Tekken, and now Street Fighter. And, but yeah, every time I think of fire, I always think of, I always think of Ken, which is funny because there's also Dalsim. But when I think of him, I always, I think of, that's the guy with the stretchy limbs who does the yoga from India. But he is also, uh, very much fire but he, he kind of he's more of a pyromancer right like he can kind of control fire and like manipulate it whereas ken is just like his attacks have fire imbued like imbued with them but uh, another fun fact is some people don't know is i have a cover that i made of this song which is a reggae version so if you ever wanted to experience a reggae version of ken's theme uh, I will link it somewhere in the description, but I'm pretty proud of that song. I thought I did it quite justice. And uh, yeah, I thought that was kind of a cool thing. Also, speaking of remixes of this, this song has been, that's been happening for decades now, my favorite remix of this song, actually, my favorite version of the song is from Street Fighter V. We don't talk about Street Fighter V. It was a uh, interesting game, to say the least. But I think we can all agree that the soundtrack was phenomenal for Five. We're currently on Six, by the way. Uh, Five's version of Ken's team is amazing. It like really describes his character so well. It's perfect, I think. Honestly, it's like perfect. And it's also the guitarist for that and composer is Masahiro Aoki, who you may recognize from some other video games. And I thought that was really cool. So yeah, iconic video game character in general and of course anything fire related is going to be it's going to have ken ken is amazing and i don't think there's any argument that he is just kind of one of the poster boys for fire and another capcom game that we have here but speaking of capcom we're going to move on to another capcom legend can you guess who it is but yes that is uh ken's team from the debut was actually i should have mentioned street fighter 2 the world warrior but it is just Ken's theme. Most people know it as. But I do love the version of from 5. All right, we move on to more Capcom with a man that is very mega. Mega Man X6, Blaze Heatnix, or the Magma Area Stage. I reacted to this not too long ago and I kind of had it confused. I thought this was a boss team but Blaze Heat Nix is the boss that you fight at the end of the stage, which is the Magma Area stage, or the Blaze Heat Nix stage, however you want to see it. But this song, um, oh man, I, 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 I wanted to hear it because I needed to hear more Mega Man. It's shown up on the channel such a low, a criminally low amount of times, and every time I hear it, it's so awesome, and I just, I want to hear more of it. And I'm glad I did, because this song has become so it's so catchy and so much energy it's just, it has so much power into it i saw footage of where it plays and it looks like a pretty intense pretty intense area and which is really funny because when i was watching it i was like man this is so much energy and it's moving so fast and the comments for it were saying uh, ironically this is the slowest stage in the game <laughs> which blew my mind because I, it's it's moving it is moving um, but yes, uh, another thing that, that I, I liked about this song is uh, the sort of electric guitar sound, which is not an electric guitar, but it really sounds like one. It just sounds really, really cool, very machine-like. And some of the most memorable, honestly, keyboard lines that I can think of. But it also reminded me of a song that I didn't mention in the first reaction video. And that song is from a band called Symphony X from the album... Uh, I wrote it down here. So, The Divine Wings of Tragedy. 
I think that's from like 1990. I didn't write down the date. It was like 96 or 97 when that came out. Uh, if you're a fan of Mega Man's music, I'm just going to say this now. You're a fan of Symphony X. <laughs> Actually, I didn't even realize X. <laughs> it's kind of fitting. But uh, Symphony X is basically like neoclassical. It sounds just like this with vocals, basically. But there's a song that you should really listen to if you like this called The Sea of Lies. And I'm not saying just listen to like some of it. Listen to the whole thing. Because that song in the guitar world where I live, that song is iconic to guitar players because of that solo. If you know that solo, you know you know. But the whole song has the energy of like Blaze Heat Mix and the Magma area. Just trust me, you'll like that song if you like this one. Action packed. This game looks super fun, I'm not gonna lie. I never played a Mega Man game. I wouldn't even know where to start. There's so many. But this game looks just the way I like looked at it, it looked super, super fun. And um, is there anything else? Oh yeah, I wrote that the setting, from what it looks like to me, it looks like a factory, kind of like a worn down factory. And there's just like uh, fire, like bursting at you in different areas, like as kind of stage hazard. But uh, it seemed like a pretty short stage as well, maybe like a couple, like two minutes or something. Side scroller, but very action packed, but apparently not action packed enough compared to the whole game, which blows my mind. But anyways, yeah, I just had to talk about um, uh, this was this was not this this did not win in the poll, and it was not one of the most votes either. But it was in the poll. But I had a platinum member kind of like suggest for me to put it because uh, they liked the song, and I wanted to do it because I needed to hear more Mega Man, and honestly, I still need to because I just haven't experienced enough of it, and I really do quite enjoy the Mega Man soundtrack. And I think Blaze Heat Mix was pretty much one of my favorites, or now has become one of my favorites. And um, I think we're going to use this as a segue as something that was really energetic and high paced and full of just not like just a bunch of stuff on screen. I think when you think of a game that has a lot of stuff on screen and fast paced, you might be able to guess what song is, is coming up next. But that is Mega Man X6. The Magma Area Blaze Heat Mix. Toho 11 Subterranean. How do I say this? Subterranean Animism. The song is called <laughs> Solar Sect of Mystic Wisdom Nuclear Fusion. This is the final boss of Toho 11. Uh, her name is Utsuho. I didn't put her last name for some reason, but it's Utsuho. And uh, Toho is uh, quite an interesting game on this channel. It is something I know very little about, but slowly have been kind of seeing more and more footage. For the longest time, almost like a year straight, I never even saw like a picture of it. And then I saw a picture of it and I was like, oh, okay, cool. And then in a recent video, I saw someone else play it without sound. So I saw it moving and I'm like, oh, okay. This was the first time I didn't film it, but doing research for this. This is the first time I saw and heard a proper Toho level. So I saw how this was being played and what the hell, dude? How do people play these games? Uh, apparently this was like on the lunatic difficulty, which is the hardest. But this is a bullet hell, meaning your, your, your character's somewhere down there, if you can see them. And all of that has to be avoided. Those are all, from what I gathered, uh, artificial suns. Those are suns being thrown at you if that's enough fire theme for you and what was cool about it the reason i wanted to see footage of this one is because when I, the comments said that the song has a, a sound effect built into it with a caution like a caution sound effect like a siren every time there's like a phase switch so like after this phase of dots you'll see you'll see like the warning like doo, 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 and then it changes to something else so the whole thing has a very alarming like uh, get it together kind of feel um this song is really catchy, dude. A lot of the Toho music, a lot of it, while it does sound similar, which is not a bad thing, I've said this multiple times, it, it just is, this is fact, it sounds similar. A lot of it is catchy. So by default, a lot of it is catchy. <laughs> but this one is really, really catchy. It gets stuck in your head. It features uh, Zun, of course, the composer, doing the trademark trumpet sound or the zumpet sound, the fast pianos, but it's just, 
I mean, all, all I can say, I, I just recommend watching... Just watch this one. You know, watch... Just look up Nuclear Fusion Boss Toho 11. You, the whole thing's like four minutes long. And, you know, it reminded me of something that I experienced. I never played a bullet hell, but kind of. This is this is going to be spoilers for like the next 20 seconds for Nier Automata. So if you do not, if you never play Nier Automata, which you should, just ignore the next 20 seconds or so, starting now. Um, there's bullet hell sections in Nier Automata where you go into, it's like a hacking section, but also a big, big spoiler at the very end. I So in a way, I kind of experienced something like this. And uh, I'll just leave it at that. Spoiler over. So, okay. <laughs> but I can't imagine like a whole game of that, you know? these the, the players of these games have to be, quite literally, the term the kids use is cracked <laughs> to play this kind of stuff. It's like, I see this and I feel like I can't even blink. I don't even know how, because I watched the, I watched the footage and I was honestly confused because to me, it looked like the character was getting hit multiple times. So I don't know if they have like shield or something, but I'm like, there's no way you can avoid all this stuff. And that's one phase. So either way, the music though, the music, very catchy, very memorable. Um, for me, for a Toho song to be memorable, it kind of says a lot because like I said, they all have a similar formula, but some of my favorite songs have come from Toho, like Lunatic Princess, uh, UN Owen was her, and now this one, this one's, maybe because I've heard it so much now since I've heard it the first time, but it's really, really cool. And I think that there's nothing more <laughs> describing of heat and fire than the sun itself. And this character is basically a, you know, culmination of the sun, nuclear fusion, and all that stuff. So it's really, really cool. And uh, I love it. I love this song. And I'm glad people voted for it. And uh, that's it. And I think there's no other better way to follow up a final boss than another final boss, but on the completely other side of theming, and that's really slow and dark. The next song on this list is Gwyn, Lord of Cinder from the game Dark Souls, the final boss of Dark Souls. And, um, Although I don't know a whole amount of context for it because I never played one, I did get a lot of comments explaining some of these things and I want to go over them. So I don't, have, I don't have experience with this game, but I did experience some feelings for the song that I think really resonated with me. First of all, a big thing I want to mention is... Um, I'm not saying anything in stone, but what I'm saying is I never had any interest in playing any sort of Dark Souls or FromSoft ever until I heard the song. And what I mean by that is knowing how the story works and how instead of like a linear story, you're following the, the soul series is a story that's already happened and you're piecing it together. I never experienced that. So that's really cool. I'm not saying I'm going to play them. I don't know anything. I'm just saying that it went from no interest to, ooh, and that was all because of this song. This song is so unique and different and honestly, Super creepy. The fire theme is Gwyn, Lord of Cinder, themselves, a shell of what they used to be. They are literally just hanging on from, think of a, I guess, I guess the uh, analogy here would think of a bright light. And this is the complete diminished last form almost at the end. That's kind of what I'm, I'm getting, right? Got a, I had a lot of comments on that video and they all kind of seem to say the same thing. I made my own guesses but uh, it seems to be sort of close. They also have a huge fire blade that um, upon defeating goes out as well. And, but the idea of a final boss song and having a piano solo is so haunting. Like it's so cool. When you think of a final boss, there's many ways it can go. It's usually very energetic. The biggest song of the game, it's really memorable. But to go from, mind you, when I think Dark Souls, I think pure orchestral, bombastic, cinematic stuff. Kind of like Monster Hunter, kind of like God of War, you know, just that really big choir stuff. So the idea of stepping into a haze of smoke 
seeing a one-on-one -on -one fight with the final boss and then hearing a solo piano with nothing else is freaky to me. That sounds freaky. I would feel like I'd be twice as nervous and scared to fight this character. So that's the, that's my initial thought of Gwen Lord Cinder. Now, the song itself is Matoi Sakuraba, who, of course, another legend here on the channel. Uh, Star Ocean, uh, Bat and Kato's just, you know, prog rock king. So to hear him just play like a piano by itself is so cool. I haven't heard that either from him. It was just like a, it felt very intimate and just different. The whole thing felt very different to me. But there's one thing that um, <laughs> that I kept seeing, and I did I had I did like a a little bit of research on this, but I think this comes down to kind of um, one of those uh, water cooler type talks if you're familiar with that term. So let me explain very quickly in my comments and every other comment for this song that you'll see on YouTube. Everyone mentions that. Oh, did you know that the song has no, uh, it's all on the white keys. There's no black keys being played on the piano because Gwen was like, you know, the, the you know, light and it relates to the story. And at first I was like, huh, okay, well, that sounds kind of cool. Now I'm not like debunking that or anything, but I looked into it and it's just kind of like basic music theory. Uh, from what I gathered from that, while that is, I think true, I'm pretty sure that is actually a fact that there's no black keys being played. I, I don't think that was intended. And what I mean by that is, uh, I think it was a coincidence because the focus of the song is the the tonal key, the key of the song. And the song is in the key of A minor. And uh, A minor is the relative of C major. And both of those, or that, that key in general has no black keys in it. There's a, any any song that's in the key of a minor or C major has that exact same thing. There's no, uh, there's no black keys. So I think what ended up happening, this is my guess. I think what ended up happening is that someone who knew that and like that music theory thing kind of just said that somewhere like on a Reddit post. And then people t took that as like a, like a cool fun fact. And while it is technically true that there is no black keys, I, I think it's more coincidental because if you know how music theory works, uh, there's hundreds and thousands of songs where they're in a certain key and they don't feature, you know, X notes or something. So I just thought that was kind of something, you know, but it was cool that it was brought to my attention because I could look into it. But I think it's it's mostly just kind of like a hearsay and like a cool fun fact because it sounds really cool on paper, right? Like you want to tell people that. Um, but I think it's mostly coincidental until I find out directly from like Matoi Sakurawa themselves. I just think it's a coincidence. But what I did think was a cool fun fact. Lear so this is what I mean. So from learning that, I learned something else. And which is an even lesser known fact, which I think is a fun fact, is that this was played on a Bosendorfer piano, which is one of the most expensive pianos in the world. And the reason it's cool is because of its extended range. It has a lower bass side. So apparently, I couldn't confirm this, but I'm pretty sure that uh, the piano we used here was a Bosendorfer. And so those really low notes you hear are only possible on that piano. So this this song has a lot of things going on with it. It's, I think for that reason, it's, it's kind of iconic. It got me to interested in the Soul series. And uh, I also followed up, well, I'm not talking about it here in this video. I did hear Soul of Cinder right after. So, uh, you know, my, my interest is, is getting there and I'm starting to be like, hmm, okay, maybe it's not just about go here and fight boss there, you know. It's, I, I like the idea. It sounds interesting to me to go around and pick up pieces of the story. I don't know why that sounds so intriguing to me. Anyways, if you want to know more about the whole um, piano thing, there's a channel called uh, Jamie Al uh, Altozano. It's in Spanish, but you can just do the captions and it'll show in English. And basically he says, um, and this I, I, I think I agree on, but I think the song was made for uh, two people to be playing the piano. So while you can play it solo, it's, it's, it seems to be written with, in mind with um, two people playing. And from what I think I gathered in that explanation was that piano one would be playing like the A minor side and piano two would be playing, I think, 
I think F major. So it was like a big dissonance in the song. I don't want to get too much into music theory here, but if you ever wonder why the song sounds a little odd and weird sometimes, I think it has to do with all those things. So an extended lower range, conflicting keys, and the fact that two people are supposed to be playing it. It's a lot of things. But what I can tell you for sure is that it's a really cool, amazing song that is very haunting and makes me kind of want to know more about Gwyn and all that stuff. So that is The Lord of Cinder from Dark Souls. Very uh, iconic song and the runner up in my most votes for fire themes. But we must, we must move on to what got the most votes, the poll winner of the fire themes on uh, my Patreon. Crisis City from Sonic the Hedgehog 2006, as well as Sonic Generations. I heard all three versions of it, and this isn't uh, which one is my favorite. I actually love them all. They all have their own cool thing about them. Uh, I'm mostly going to be talking about the original, but I do definitely have a, a special place in my heart for all three of them. This was the winner of my poll of fire themes people. This one, like, substantially. And uh, let's, let's talk about it. I did not play this game, so I have to piece together some comments and stuff. This is from composer Tamoya Otani, and uh, originally from 2006. Apparently the game, though, from what I noticed in the comments, that it's generally kind of a disliked game. I know it's subjective. But I think most of the comments I saw were obviously praising the music, but the game itself was kind of... Uh, and then in 2011 with uh, Sonic Generations, and I think that game was received kind of well. And that one was the um, 20th anniversary game from what I recall. So even though we're hearing um, 2006 original version, the screenshot here I think is from the classic generation one because of that meme right there. This song apparently has spawned a lot of memes. There's so many memes. Every like every comment you see on my video is just like fire tornado or the whole city's on fire. Just, just so many things. Uh, this is one of my favorite videos I did on, on the channel. It's it, it captured me right away. I barely talked to that whole video. <laughs> I love the drum and bass feel of it. It's got this kind of spy feel it's just perfect energy perfect tempo the big stabby chords everything sounds so cool even though it's really high up on this list i don't want to talk too much about it it's just there's not much to say it kind of speaks for itself you know what i mean like i'm not sure what led up to happening here but basically what i get the gist of is the whole city's on fire <laughs> you know like the whole this like a crumbling like metropolis area it looks kind of like new york or something or chicago and it looks it's just all engulfed there's lava on the ground there's fire here there's fire there everything's burning everything's crumbling this thing is like just falling apart and you're just like jumping through everything whereas in the original game it seems to be more of a behind the back 3d sonic so you're kind of following him and there's a lot of rails and stuff and apparently in that game, the song is kind of split into four sections, three or four sections. So the way I heard it isn't the way it's necessarily played in game, but I'm really glad I heard it the way I did. Because when I heard it as a full song, there was like a teaser ending, which I loved. And I thought the, I thought the song was over and I was ready to like quick uh, click stop and then perfect ending, which sounded like sirens and stuff, which by the way, I would like to say that that's one of my favorite things in music in general, not just VGM, is long, cool outros. You know, there's a lot of different ways to end a song. You can fade it out, you can abruptly stop, you can have like little trail ends of something. But when it's like a long, almost its own thing, like it's past a minute and it's just, it feels like a ride, you know? It's usually instrumental and uh, a band that I'm a big fan of that does that before they were cool <laughs> that was Gojira you might have heard of them from recently doing the Olympics uh, I've been listening to them for quite a while but um, they do that a lot they do that a lot and I've always thought it was really cool uh, my favorite one being well there's two there's uh, The Art of Dying which has an amazing outro and there's also uh, Global Warming which kind of fitting here uh, you know it's, it's like the song ends and then it just 
goes into a very long ending. That's, that's what's happening in the original 2006 version, and I loved it for it. It was so cool. It's so rare in VGM. I think it's one of the more rare things in VGM to have a long outro like that. So, and then the other ones, the classic version was really amazing too. It kind of changed up the intro rhythm. Very, very cool, very clean sounding. They all were great. And then the modern one had like the Rhodes piano. I could, there's so much to talk about. But I, I just I just really want to like emphasize that this is one of the better songs I've heard in BGM in my life. <laughs> so I'm really grateful that you guys showed it to me because this is kind of as silly as it sounds. The songs like this that is kind of why I started doing the auditorium in the first place is to hear like what's out there that I would normally not hear and that will become like my favorites or become something that I talk about now. So I, I now possess the information of Crisis City and I can spread the word too now and I can, you know, I'll have it, I'll talk about it, you know, it's now part of my, my repertoire. So it's, uh, it's such an iconic song to me and I'm, I'm kind of sad I got to it very, very late. This was requested a long time ago, but I got to it very late. But hey, that's like, I guess that's one good thing of the VGM Vibe series, right? We could kind of, it, it wouldn't, I wouldn't have heard it if it wasn't for the VGM, VGM Vibe series. Well, I would have, but if, who knows when. So either way, the song is super, super Hall of Fame, iconic status to me. I loved it. I loved all versions equally. They're all good. <laughs> and I just think it's, uh, I just want to hear more versions of it. If it exists, let me know. But that is the runner up. We now have to talk about the, um, the song that inspired the video. So just really quickly, every time I do the Vibe series, they're never ranked in any, like, I don't like them more than the rest. But the, the, the last song is always the song that inspired the entire episode. So before I had any of these, I already knew what number one was going to be, that kind of thing. So we're going to move on to what inspired the whole episode. But very, very quickly, I want to talk about two songs that are honorable mentions very very quick and those are both uh final fantasy songs and that is find your way from <laughs> the fire cavern in final fantasy 8 which we're not going to talk about no the reason i want to bring it up is because it became kind of a meme in my community i couldn't find the fire cavern blah 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 and of course ifri is there but it also isn't just playing there so i didn't want to in include it it also plays somewhere else that has nothing to do with fire so uh, and then also the uh, Those Chosen by the Planet from Final Fantasy VII, otherwise known as the iconic Nibelheim fire scene with Sephiroth. Very, very cool, very iconic, but um, it's not really a fire theme, but I think most people associate it with fire. <laughs> it's a pretty iconic stage in uh, video game history. Anyways, so kind of weird not having Nobuo Matsu in the VGM 5 series, but I guess technically he made it, so. We now move on to uh, what I consider the quintessential fire theme, at least for me, and what inspired the whole video. The Village of Decay from Goals and Ghosts is my quintessential fire song and something that I thought of long, long ago because I wanted to always talk about this song. There's lots to talk about here, but basically... Um, the thing I wanted to address first is, and I mean this truthfully still, I've never heard another song that sounds like this in video games history. Like it's it's always has such a unique place in my heart, in my ears, in my mind. Nothing sounds like anything to me like this. And at least I haven't heard it yet. But I remember when I played this game on the Sega Genesis, uh, it's stage two of this game. And I remember vividly stopping just like what am i listening to it sounded so jolly and i think it was like the first time in my life i ever heard anything sort of reminiscent of like a renaissance type of song and kind of piratey and you know just i was like what is this and it just stuck with me it stuck with me like forever the one we're hearing right now, though, is the arcade version, which is the original version. But I do love the Sega Genesis version just as much. They both have a very cool sound. I recommend both. This game was ported all over the place. Fun fact, uh, Tim Fallen actually did the soundtrack for one of the versions. I, th I think the Commodore 64, I'm not sure. Which I haven't even heard that one yet, but something else. 
Ghosts and Ghosts is the sequel to uh, Ghosts and Goblins. I always confuse those two. Um, and it is known by um, a different name in Japan. I think it was Tak Takai Takamura. I'll look it up right now. I forgot, but something like that. And over here, it's obviously known as Goals and Ghosts, a side-scroller game where it's pretty difficult. You are you are um, Sir Arthur, and you're basically saving the queen. And the thing about this song is that it's so bizarre. It's extremely catchy. There is so many counter melodies. I recommend if you hear this song for the first time, put on some headphones and try to catch everything that's happening at once. It's a short loop, but in that loop, there's like four songs happening inside of it. So this thing is drenched in fire. So we have fire windmills. We have, we're gonna talk about him later. We have fire, we have fire everything. The enemies turn into fire when you, when you kill them. The second half of the stage is fire ceilings, fire floors, fire pillars, fire birds. The boss is a fire Cerberus. Um, the, the, <laughs> the door to get out is full of fire. And of course the background, which is the main thing of the game. The whole background is a village burning while we hear this nice jolly song playing in the background. It's such a, it's such a mind trip. But speaking of, the, of this screen here, I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure it's a guess that this game also debuted uh, the character named Firebrand. There's this little tiny sub boss in the stage uh, right here, and he looks just like Firebrand from, I think, the game Demon's Crest, who also appears in the game Marvel vs. Capcom. And Firebrand became like his own game and series. I'm pretty sure he came from Goals and Ghosts. So I could be wrong about that. But, anyways, that's still also fire. So. I, I tried looking it up, but I couldn't find much. I just I just think he's from this world originally. Uh, so let's check my notes here. We have uh, floating fire enemies, fire ceiling, fire floor, fire pillars, fire background, the floating Cerberus. Um, the, actually, technically, when you fight the Cerberus, the song changes just a little bit. I didn't include it here, but it's like the same motif, just a little creepier sounding. I think overall, um, this song has stayed with me for about 30 years now. It is instantly recognizable. It is so unique. And the fact that it's playing such a kind of happy sounding song while pure destruction is happening in the background is a little bit of a uneasy feeling. And I think that's another reason it stuck with me too. It's, it's not pleasant. <laughs> And I do remember this game being pretty difficult, and it's just, it's just iconic. I know they've made more games since then. Uh, I haven't played them, so I don't know if they ever returned to this place or not. But The Village of Decay has always been a, uh, a staple in video game history to me. It's one, of, it's one of the songs that I heard early on in my life that definitely formed my love for uh, video game music. So along with Sonic, MK, and, and all that. So technically this video has a lot of my early, early inspirations for video game history. And I don't hear, I don't feel, I don't see a lot of people talk about this game. Some people know about it, but I, it'll always hold a special place. And uh, it's a nice challenge. It's, it's nice to watch people play it. You know, you have to beat it two times, so. But you can tell that this was made for arcades. Like it's made to steal your quarters. You know, like it's, it's difficult but not impossible. Anyways, that is my number one pick for the fire themes. And we are finished with VGM Vibes 5. I am already in the works of starting VGM Vibes 6, which has already been determined by my Patreon, which were voted by both paid members and free members. And the next episode, can you guess, is the complete opposite of fire is snow and ice. So we're going on the other side into the chilly zone. And I already have songs, of course, planned out for those. But I want to see what you guys come up with, too. And uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. So thank you for continuing to watch my Vibe series. It's really fun to just blab about songs I know, but also songs I don't know. And it opens more opportunities to hear stuff and let your voices be heard. So let me know what uh, Fire songs you like. What's, which ones didn't make it? Maybe they'll be in a sequel to a Fire episode. And uh, whatever you want to tell me. 
Thank you to all my patrons here. I cannot be here without them. Thanks to you for watching and supporting. My name is Jesse. I will see you in the next video in VGM Vibe 6 where it'll be cold and chilly. Take it easy.